Good morning. I'm very honored, uh, like the other speakers, to be uh, presenting to you today about something that has uh, consumed my life for the last year or so, or almost two years now. Um, and that's uh, this expedition, uh, uh, Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. And I was also honored to be invited to, um, to actually participate in this, in this uh, as co-chief scientist. I want to give a little background about scientific ocean drilling. Uh, scientific ocean drilling got its start with Project Mohol in 1958. These photographs are of that uh, expedition. Um, and actually, it was an article in Life written by John Steinbeck, who spent some time on the platform during that uh, first effort to drill into the ocean floor. Um, since 1973, ocean drilling, scientific ocean drilling, has really been an international effort. And the number of countries involved have increased over the years. A new program will begin, uh, essentially a continuation, has the same acronym actually, uh, in 2013 or 2014 uh, for continued uh, collaboration in scientific drilling. In integration ocean drilling program um, expeditions are really take advantage of the technology that we've heard about in terms of oil drilling and gas drilling but are, have a different purpose. And they're really driven by science proposals generated from the community and the expeditions typically take, uh, each expedition typically takes two months in duration. And on the expedition, in addition to the maritime crew and the drilling engineers, is an international team of about 25 to 30 scientists uh, that are, uh, dedicate their time to analyzing and, and sampling uh, core samples. And it turns out coring is a very slow, methodical process and takes a lot of manpower to analyze the samples. And so even in the best uh, conditions, progress in drilling is much slower than what we just saw in the in oil industry. We only drill about 30 or 60 meters per day when we're coring. The secondary fo focus is collecting uh, borehole geophysical data using tools, downhole tools like what was told to us about Schlumberger's uh, efforts, and also establishing uh, long-term borehole observatories in the ocean. There's a lot of science that's done in ocean drilling. Uh, some of the high profile stuff is really uh, like climate research. Uh, the oceans, the sediments in the ocean contain a huge and continuous record of climate change. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about, a lot of new interest also in life in extreme environments, like in, in the deep biosphere. And uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is the continuing effort to study subduction zones, uh, systems, and tsunami causing earthquake faults. Um, Let me just talk a little bit about faulting. As you may well know, over the last 100 years, the, uh, we've had a, a number of very large, uh, devastating earthquakes. The distribution of the 20 largest is shown in this map. Um, and uh, you can see that they are not distributed uniformly geographically. They occur on the Ring of Fire around the Pacific Ocean and also on the eastern side of the Indian Ocean. Uh, almost all the 20 events are associated with subduction zones and are these great earthquakes caused, uh, which we call mega, associated with the mega thrust or the plate boundary fault between the subducting plate and the overriding plate. The top four shown here, the Chile quake, uh, Alaskan uh, Good Friday quake, this recent Sumatra uh, earthquake, which we all saw uh, the devastating effect from the tsunami, and the most recent Tohoku event, which is the fourth biggest in the last 100 years. Um, the Sumatra obviously caused, was devastating in terms of lives lost, uh, over 200,000 people. All these events and all 20 of these large earthquakes uh, generated tsunamis. These big ones, um, although uh, the Chile quake and the Sumatra generated locally very large waves, 25 meters in some cases, the Tohoku event is distinguished because it had uh, mammoth waves all along the Japan coast, coast, 30 and 40 meters high, and um, and also led to uh, loss of life. We're very familiar with this because of the media coverage uh, of of the of the of the tsunami, and in in general, Japan is uh, very well prepared, and the citizens are very well educated about the hazards of earthquakes and tsunamis. The infrastructure is well designed to to withstand earthquake shaking. In this event, um, uh, well, I should also mention that the Japanese have a system for, um, uh, for real-time warning. And 
although uh, the system that they set up uh, kind of failed with this um, uh, unexpected and uh, monumental event. Um, most of the devastation was actually from the tsunami itself because of the good engineering practices in Japan, and that's shown in the Pi diagram, and most, of the, most lives were lost associated with the tsunami. This turns out to be the most costly nas single natural disaster in history, estimated at $300 billion, which is probably an underestimate in re reality. And uh, as I said, 19,000 deaths. The plate tectonic setting in Japan is complicated. It's, it occurs in several plates, the Philippine plate to the southeast, uh, subducting under Japan, the Eurasian part of the, uh, of the plate, and then the Pacific plate in the, in the northeast, uh, subducting underneath actually the North American plate in northern Japan. And, um, and the Pacific plate is an old, uh, very uh, old and cold oceanic lithospheric plate. And as it subducts under Japan, it forms an extremely deep uh, trench, the Japan Trench. And the location of the earthquake, the tsunami quake, is shown in the red ellipse there. It's about the size of the ruptured area. Um, turns out that the Pacific plate is moving at about nine centimeters per year towards Japan. So that every hundred years or so, it builds up enough displacement because the plates stick uh, to create magnitude seven and magnitude eight earthquakes about every hundred years. And Japan has a long historical record, uh, accurate record of, of earthquakes and tsunamis uh, in northern Japan. And before the Tohoku event in the last 400 years, I recorded 13 magnitude sevens and five magnitude eight earthquakes. And so this is consistent with the displacement rate. We believed that, the, that these earthquakes were relieving the built up of displacement or, or forces associated with the plate convergence and uh, did not expect a magnitude nine earthquake. So the Tohoku was unique in this respect too and very unexpected. It turns out that the Tohoku event is the best instrumented earthquake, uh, great subduction mega thrust earthquake and tsunami uh, in history. The Japan Japanese have set up uh, very dense seismic networks on the islands, some offshore instruments, uh, and also a very dense GPS network. So they can measure displacements in short, short periods and also long periods. And, uh, and they also have a, a network of, um, of seafloor pressure gauges, relatively few, uh, out to about 100 kilometers from the coastline. And they also have um, uh, buoys uh, for measuring wave height and a number of other observatories. From this data, uh, uh, using these various data sets over different time frames, uh, scientists can invert and determine the slip distribution of the earthquake. And, uh, and this was surprising. The map on the right shows the inferred slip distribution based on tsunami wave analysis. The plot on the lower left, I should say, is a result of two pressure sensors on the sea floor, about 100 kilometers out, in, close to the epicentral area, which is shown by the blue star on the map. And what you see is the change in wave height with time. And, uh, and the, uh, the uh, noteworthy point here is that the broad wave, the broad hump, is what we expect normally with a tsunami, but there was this sharp, shorter period, impulsive wave riding on top of that. And the analyses that were done showed that that wave largely originated at the trench uh, itself, way out, 250 kilometers from the coastline. And this was entirely unexpected. Uh, we'd never documented that slip had occurred so far out and at the trench. Usually it occurs uh, uh, more around the epicentral area and to the coastline. This is a unique aspect of this earthquake, or at least the first documented earthquake like this. And it consists of a compound rupture. And more than that, uh, repeated bathymetric and seismic surveys that are done by the Japan, that is surveys before the quake and after the quake, document that in, in the, uh, in, out at the trench, right at the trench axis, the displacement on the fault was 50 meters. It's a half a football field in length. Unheard of amount magnitude of displacement. This is more than twice the largest measurements ever documented before for an earthquake. And the displacement increases all the way to the trench, which is quite remarkable. Well, you can imagine there's a lot of scientific response to an event like this, uh, so, so a society response as well. Um, there's a strong belief, really knowledge actually, that the, that the loss of life could have largely uh, been prevented if we had more instrumentation and real-time monitoring. And, and technology like the wave glider and other 
uh, wired networks that the Japanese are now putting in off the coastline are going to allow them to be much better prepared in real-time warning. But it also begs the questions of how can we understand how this large slip that was completely unexpected uh, occurs out near the trench. Uh, we hypothesize, actually, and this is an increasingly a favored hypothesis, that faults, that plate boundary faults are weak, but not only that, during an earthquake, they weaken dramatically, possibly even essentially friction dropping towards zero. We haven't been able to test that. It's a very difficult thing to test. And this also, we also want to know what are the processes and conditions that allow that to occur, because if we can understand that, then we have, can address the question of where else this can occur if this is a unique once in a, in, a, in a millennium event or whether this is in fact a typical event that we should expect in other locations. And the expedition that we, I'm talking about JFAST, uh, the Japan Trench Fast Drilling Project, Expedition 343 of the IODP, is the first rapid response scientific drilling and ocean drilling to try to address questions like these that can only be addressed uh, by drilling immediately after an earthquake and into the earthquake source. Uh, we take advantage of the drill ship Chikyu, uh, a, a modern uh, uh, petroleum type deep water drill ship built by the Japanese, commissioned 2005. And as we heard about before, it's, it's designed to, with oil field technology uh, to drill uh, riser holes, that is where the mud, the drilling mud is circulated back to the ship um, and contained. And it can drill in waters up, up to 2.5 kilometers. It can also do the typic, more typical ocean drilling, which is non-riser, where there is no return of the mud to the ship, where the seawater is pumped down in to, to facilitate removal of the chips and it just dumps out on the seafloor. In that case, you can go to much greater water depths, which we had to use in order to get to the earthquake source in our case. The Chikyu is, has dynamic positioning. We drop beacons on the seafloor so we can position it. It has a completely automated uh, uh, drill floor like a, any other modern ship. Um, it's computer controlled from the driller's booth. and uh, it. But unlike other ships, it has a remarkable research laboratory. The core is brought from the derrick up to the location labeled five, which is a science stack, uh, several floors of science labs. It's actually the most fantastic equipped lab uh, uh, that I've ever been in, in one location, for analyzing the core. And this is manned by the science uh, team, uh, two groups with 12-hour shifts, so that we can continuously analyze cores as the drilling continues around the clock. Let me just go over the goals really quickly. Uh, the IODP expedition had three main goals. On the right, you see the map. Again, another representation of the slip distribution. The location is labeled JFAS with a red dot. It's right out at the trench. We first wanted to use the kind of tools that uh, the Schlumberger uh, provides, that is, uh, logging while drilling and measurement while drilling, to make geophysical measurements, um, to actually de determine where the fault is located, and also, I won't talk about this, but determine the in situ stress. And then we, the other goal is to take core samples of the fault itself to characterize the conditions down there and try to understand the processes of earthquake slip. And finally, to place a temperature observatory across the fault um, so that we can determine how much heat was generated during the earthquake event and actually, for the first time, try to quantify the absolute frictional strength of the fault and the absolute strength in the crust. And it's really this last step, step three, that is, that is, demands the rapid response. Because just like when you rub your hands together to warm them through friction, the heat dissipates quickly. So the same thing happens in the Earth. We had to drill the hole within about a year after the event. Let me just summarize oceanic subduction. For, so, for some of you that I may not be familiar with this concept of plate tectonics, the upper diagram in the left shows a block diagram looking through this, the seawater to the seafloor. You see the islands on the left, upper left side, that represents Japan and the North American plate. The lower right-hand side is looking at the surface of the Pacific plate, and it conveys towards the Japan and then bends and subducts underneath. And the, that side cross-sectional view is shown in this cartoon here. And just I just want to point out that the oceanic crust is created at the mid-ocean ridges, thousands of kilometers away. Uh, from volcanic activity and then forms the oceanic crust made of basalt. On the lower side, you see the sediments that are deposited out deep at sea. You produce clay deposits and chert, and then as the, the plate moves towards the, towards the land, then you get coarser and coarser debris uh, and mudstones and sandstones deposited. Depending how much sediment is deposited on the, on the lithosphere as it approaches the, the overriding plate, a lot of it gets scraped off like a bulldozer and forms what we call an accretionary prism. And you'll see that in this next slide, 
On the lower right is a, is a seismic image that's colored. The dark brown shows the oceanic plate subducting. You see it's a rough surface on top. And then the tan and the yellow and the gray uh, wedge is the overriding prism, the accretionary prism of the plate. And the plate interfaces at that boundary between the dark brown below and the other. You see the curvature of the plate as it's subducting. And the red line shows our drill site uh, in deep water to penetrate through the upper part of the upper plate and penetrate into the, the lower plate and cross the fault. Before the drilling expedition, that section on the left shows what we anticipated encountering a bunch of deformed mudstones, and then the boundary where the fault is located. And we could tell when we crossed it because we would hit chert and basalt of the lower, of the lower plate, and, uh, which are very hard rocks and obviously difficult to drill. And there's a number of challenges that we have in this expedition. Um, uh, some dealing with time. A typical expedition to put together takes many years, uh, many steps, a lot of proposals to write, and site surveys of seismic uh, nature and so forth. Um, drilling uh, challenges, we'll see that the water depth is very high, long drill string, weather's a complete, uh, complicating factor. We also have additional complexity with placing an observatory. The seafloor conditions and the borehole conditions are uncertain because we're drilling into a fault zone that just ruptured and displaced 50 meters. Um, and then the last thing is uh, unlike uh, oil and gas drilling, there is no uh, monetary return once you've completed the hole. It's just science, and so it's expensive, and so cost is a, is a challenge. And then the other thing of this, of this particular expedition, the Japanese, who uh, obviously funded this, the building of this uh, scientific drill ship, um, follow it closely. And, and in light of Tohoku and the mission of this expedition, uh, paid particular attention to the outcomes. As a co-chief scientist, I was fairly stressed worrying about success of the mission, I have to admit. Our timeline was, rem was a record setting. We basically, one year and one month later after the earthquake, we were putting the drill bit to the ground, to the seafloor. Um, and we were, it was helped by the fact that several years previous, a workshop was held that really laid out the whole concept and the science behind this rapid response drilling. And we worked from that uh, directly. Um, and worked like uh, demons with engineers to try to manage and develop this, uh, this um, expedition. I should point out, even our seismic surveys didn't come in but just a few months before uh, we actually set, set sail. This is the first rapid response drilling ever in the ocean drilling program in response to an earthquake like this. This is a cross-sectional view, actually real seismic data with interpretation and drawn to scale. So you can see the size of the ship, the length of the drill string, which actually our water depth is seven kilometers, and our target, which is the plate boundary shown in the black line there at the bottom of the red line, uh, the plate boundary between the prism shown in brown and the subducting uh, plate of basalt shown in green, and the incoming sediment stack that's relatively thin um, in this case. And uh, um, uh, this, this is, um, the deepest uh, scientific drill hole uh, ever drilled into the ocean floor, at least from the total drill string length. The water depth is extreme. There was one previous hole by the Glomar Challenger in the Marianas Trench that had a slightly deeper water depth, but they only did hydraulic piston core and they just grabbed a, a 20 meters of mud from the top of the layer. We, had, we, in order to reach our target, had to drill about a kilometer down into the uh, sea floor. The weather conditions uh, were complicating with a long drill string in the ship. Um, they had to engineer uh, by new pipe, so it's super strong, um, and have strict operating limits. In the end, we lost about 15% of our time just waiting on weather because the swell was too great. And uh, it turned out the currents, although we worried about that, did not turn out to be a, a complicating factor while we were out at sea. Um, this is a brief review, review of the operations, and the operations are a little bit complicated because we have to re-enter the borehole uh, in riser drilling, which means we have to set a wellhead uh, first, jet in a wellhead that has a, re a, a, a re-entry cone, and that's shown on the left, actually. This is the, the release, the running tool that released the wellhead after we jetted it in. We actually jetted in three wellheads, uh, but we, uh, and the final one uh, was good. Um, or, or we were successful in drilling the hole and placing the observatory. The, the, um, the wellhead is only about two feet in diameter, the cone, so it's not a very big cone, it's a very small target, which is 
remarkable that at seven kilometers depth you can get to the drill stem back in that hole. Uh, it's quite an amazing thing to watch. And then, of course, after we set the well hub, we have to drill a hole, and then we have to pull out, and then we have to send this drill stem down again with the observatory and stick it back in the hole and leave it uh, to make measurements. And this all relies on the, on the ability to see the, the underwater. Uh, the water depth is so great that operating an ROV from the ship is not practical, uh, the drill ship. And so uh, we use an underwater TV. That arrangement on the top right is the frame that slides around the drill stem and lowers, it has light, cable supports it. And it turns out that one of our biggest challenges was the cable itself, um, seven kilo kilometer long fiber optic and electrical cable. It progressively failed. We had to repair it twice on ship um, and, and re-splice it. And the, res and the reason was is because the spool itself was not designed to be strong enough and so it deformed and that led to improper winding and pinching of the cable. Some, this, the last thing we would have worried about in planning the expedition was the spool of the, of the cable. It turned out to cause probably about two weeks total de delay of our, of our expedition. Ultimately it did fail. We had to have a technical extension in order to complete the drilling of the borehole that was used for the observatory and placing the observatory. And then we have to recover the observatory and we use an ROV, uh, the Kaiko, which has seven kilometer water depth capability and will, has been down there um, uh, to look at it and, uh, and will recover the observatory. This is just some photos from the LWD hole that we drilled and I'm just gonna show you something really quickly here, not really any of the data, but Using things like image logs and, uh, and other geophysical logs, we compiled the data to, to identify two main faults uh, in, in the borehole shown by red. The bottom one turns out to be the plate boundary fault. We kind of knew that, actually, after looking at it. The second hole we drilled after the LWD hole was the coring hole, and we did actually capture the core from the fault itself, and that's what these scientists, my co-chief Jim uh, Morey on the right, uh, were all smiles. Uh, this is uh, rarer than moon rocks, uh, a rock like this. It's the first time we've really recovered the fault rock itself uh, from an uh, earthquake fault, and particularly, obviously, one that has just ruptured uh, from the ocean. Um, uh, this is just showing you some of the geophysical data. I don't want to talk about it, but because we could use geophysical data from the LWD hole and locate the fault very precisely, uh, we modified our drilling program. On the left is the sections that we drilled. So when we got close to the fault, we actually took very short drilling runs, only three meters of coring runs to try to recover as much core as we could. And we did manage to get a meter. That, that the core that is of the fault itself is on the right. It's, that's a CAT scan uh, used, uh, taken on the ship right after recovery of the core. And, um, and that material is now in the hands of scientists that are doing all kinds of studies uh, to try to understand the processes. It turns out it's largely clay, and it's from the clay, of, I mentioned the pelagic clay deposits at the base of the sedimentary section. section. That is what was uh, activated uh, by the fault, and, um, and that has significance because all over the Pacific plate in the northwest is under the sediments uh, on the plate, sitting on the basalt is this clay layer, it's shown in this other drill hole drilled many years ago, a DSDP site, uh, but elsewhere in the Pacific Plate as well. If you look at that brown layer at the very bottom, that's the weak clay. And it means that this fault formed in a very weak layer, and there's also something that makes it weaken even more during an earthquake slip, and we're trying to understand what that is. The significance of this is that, that in this trench, uh, we expect that that layer, which is the fault forming layer, occurs throughout the Pacific Plate in the Northwest, and so maybe uh, the fault that we drilled at JFAST uh, is, is a type example, which raises the question, or actually uh, supports the hypothesis, that these kind of events could occur elsewhere uh, in the future, and have occurred elsewhere in the past. Uh, this is the ROV looking at the, uh, visiting the um, the uh, observatory uh, in Oct October, took a photo of it. Um, uh, this was uh, to locate it exactly. It turned out the uh, location of the ship is known, of course, exact exactly, but the hole that wasn't known exactly. So the ROV went down to just locate the thing. It was about 200 meters away from where we thought it was. Uh, but they did locate it and took a picture, and it looks in good shape. It's, uh, it's very exciting. The design of the observatory is on the right, basically, 
uh, we have a long rope contain, uh, holding about uh, 50 or 60 instruments that measure temperature and pressure. They're autonomous, they log their own data. And uh, with greater density down near the fault at about 820 meters, um, so that we can make measurements over time. And uh, we'll pull this, we'll try to pull this out in uh, February. Interestingly, we anticipate the fault may continue to slip. They often do after an earthquake. And it may pinch the casing and, and trap the instruments. So we built in weak links uh, with progressively higher strength upwards. So if, we, if that does happen, um, uh, at least we can break the rope uh, at the appropriate place, the ideal place at the fault, and at least get the upper half. Um, we're very hopeful this data comes in. This is the final observatory design, actually. Uh, on the lower right is of interest, that's the model prediction of the heat anomaly, the temperature anomaly that we expect to see. You see, after a year, it's about 20 or 30 meters wide. The magnitude is only one degree C over background. And over the next, uh, it, it, the observatory is going to be in for about seven months uh, at the minimum. Uh, and we should see the evolution in the uh, temperature anomaly that is broadening and decreasing amplitude with time. And we'll be able to use this to interpret how much heat was generated, which we can then, in the green box, back out exactly what the strength of the fault was during the 50 meters of close seismic slip. This has never been done before, and, um, and we hope that the data comes out successfully and we can make the analysis. Finally, I think I'm out of time, is that right? Um, I'd just like to summarize uh, the expedition. We did uh, document the structure of the prism and we located the fault. That was our first challenge. And obviously, uh, downhole instruments were key to that success. Um, uh, the fault is uh, different than any other fault that we've drilled in, the in this kind of s subduction zone setting before. This one is extremely localized. In other locations like Barbados, Costa Rica, and in the Nankai Trough where we've drilled, not after an earthquake, but just drilled, we've never really sampled it, but with geophysical data we can see that the faults are much broader and thicker. And this one is extremely localized, which is consistent with it being um, um, a weak and, um, and the site of repeated slip uh, and, uh, and also dynamic weakening. So we think this is key and consistent with the occurrence of a major earthquake slip event like observed in, in Tohoku. Uh, the core samples of the fault were collected. We uh, are now in the hands of a number of different scientists in all different disciplines looking for records of ancient earthquake slip. Uh, or indications of processes of weakening uh, and, and fault slip during earthquakes, as well as other physical properties like permeability and thermal properties that go into the modeling of the temperature data that we will get from the observatory. Um, I didn't talk about this, but we determined the current stress state and the fact that the hole actually was stable. Our biggest concern was the hole would be unstable, but it turned out to be very stable. And this is consistent with a total stress drop, also consistent with complete uh, weakening. And what this means is that, th that this earthquake represents the culmination of 500 to 1,000 years of accumulated slip of the Pacific Plate. Deeper, the earthquake ruptures every 100 years or so, relieving about 10 meters at a time. But after 1,000 years, 500 to 1,000 years, it builds up about 50 meters or 60 meters of slip, and apparently this is released periodically, maybe every fifth or sixth great earthquake, we get the uh, mega thrust super great uh, event like Tohoku. And this is the concern, if this happens here, it can happen in other places as well. And it wouldn't be in our historical records, which is why we were so surprised by it. And uh, then the recovery of the temperature observatory is gonna uh, answer questions that we've never been able to answer before. And right now, the findings suggest that Tohoku-like event could occur elsewhere in the Japan Trench and in other subduction zones. And this effort to do a rapid response expedition was, uh, in our case, uh, thank, well, thank, thank you, <laughs> was a wonderful success. Uh, and I guess the next picture is of the science and sci some of the scientists and the engineers uh, after we took our last core. You can see me in there, you'll see I have a very big smile because uh, we knew we had reached at least two of our main goals by this time and the third was in, in grasp. We knew we could do it. And, um, and I think this is the happiest time the crew was, maybe with the exception of disembarking after two months on a dry ship. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Great talk. I'm just wondering, uh, was it, it two, 2D seismic that you're able to look at? Huh? Uh, we, we did um, the uh, typical procedure now is to do a 3D seismic grid. Uh, so I, I can't remember exactly the details of the spacing and so forth, but there is a large area around the drill site where we use uh, uh, seismic lines that are parallel to the transport direction and perpendicular. But I think the analysis of that is still ongoing because it, it was such a shortened time frame, we couldn't completely get that data analyzed before we went out. So we're actually working for much of the planning on older seismic that was a single line. It's just amazing to me, you know, that, that the amount of destruction that's caused and yet we, we still can't seem to fund a proper image of these very destructive zones. Yeah, they're, well, they're very thin, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> In this just, case. just one other comment. I mean, the, the core is fascinating. And, it, it reminds me of outcrops in Oman where the uh, Arabian plate and the Indian plate uh, a long time ago uh, had this charred zone. So I'm wondering if there's an analog there. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I, didn't, I don't talk about this unless we're with a bunch of structural geologists, but the, I'm not one. the rock is uh, what we call a, a, scaly, a scaly clay. It's a scaly fabric. And uh, pretty much the um, conventional wisdom is that 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 fabric represents a seismic steady slip. So that's what we discovered in the borehole, which is another surprise, which is always illuminating. Okay, two more questions over here first. Um, there's a movie, uh, a film currently in the movie theaters, The Impossible, about a, supposedly about a true story of a tsunami. And I was just wondering if you could comment on its relevance to your work, uh, the, the uh, accuracy of the science and the size of that tsunami. Uh, you know, I don't know that movie. I, oh, I, okay. I'm looking forward to it, though. <laughs> uh, okay. I can tell you that uh, in the past, uh, like, for example, treating uh, uh, earthquakes or volcanoes in Hollywood, uh, there has been some success in, in realism, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, nonsense, too. I don't know what this one's about. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I just, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. I was interested in your statement that there was no historical record of anything like this, but my understanding is there are at least anecdotal historical records in Japan that go back maybe 1,500 or more years, and there was an event around 800 uh, that indicated that there was a, a super tsunami. Yeah, that's the Jogan earthquake in, uh, in the Sendai Plain. Uh, the deposits would have been studied there uh, prior to um, the event and prior to the, our expedition, obviously. And the interesting thing there is that the conventional wisdom of studying tsunami deposits has now been modified after studying the deposits of the Tohoku event and probably the Sumatran event as well, but particularly the Tohoku event, because they studied the deposits that the run-up in, in the Sendai Plain was, was kilometers inland and it deposited um, sediments that were coarse grain near the coast and then went finer and finer grained in, in, inland. And so now, going back and trenching and looking at the, the tsunami deposits of this event about, uh, about 1000 uh, AD um, in the same location, uh, shows that it has the same deposits. The run-ups are almost exactly the same. Our initial, before that, our interpretation was that the run-up was only about half that because we were using basically sand deposits to say the extent of the tsunami deposit. But now we know better. And so now we realize that the Jogon event is probably exactly, well, not exactly, but probably an analogous event. And it about a thousand years ago is consistent with this amount of slip that's released. So it probably also was a compound event. Um, that's a very good question. And this is, you know, every time, it pretty much says in earthquake science, every time there's a new earthquake, uh, we learn more. Uh, we just, it, because they're so infrequent and the repeat time is so long, uh, it's hard to get, um, um, uh, a lot of knowledge from the historical records only, but this isn't a case where we've learned an immense amount from this one event. Thank you. Thank you. Great.